reflect on their careers and sort of give us the broad brush strokes overview of the technology changes and particularly focus on a few, you know, concluding with the emerging technologies that you're grappling with now. And I'd like to add to that conversation uh, by sharing that back in 1987, I worked as um, a manager for Citibank in India, and I imported the first ATM machine to the country. And it was so popular that people would bring family over on the weekend to show them the machine to say, look, there's a machine that gives money. And we had to recruit a security guard to keep the queue moving because it was a tourist attraction. And last year when I was in India, there was practically an ATM about every kilometer. So the world has changed a lot. And over the Easter brunch, my friends were discussing having their DNA sample read to say whether they were inclined to have certain genetic conditions. Um, and the bioscientist amongst us was saying, this is not science yet. It's like reading the horoscope. <laughs> and my teenage son was talking about Google bringing their self-driving car to the school. So lots of changes going on in technology, a long way from uh, a machine that spit out money and amazed people to where we are today. Um, and let's hear from the panel with their experiences of what they've experienced and what it is that they're grappling with today. Well, I, um, I started off as a uh, programmer, you know, many years ago, and I'm going to start dating myself using COBOL, right? And um, kind of better, um, you know, lucky than smart, I was able to, you know, kind of advance in my career. And I've been really lucky, you know, to work for some, uh, companies that have done a lot of really innovative things, you know, right place, right time. And, um, but I, I think of some of the technology that's out there, you know, cloud, social, mobile, big data, and what it, the opportunities are there. And they're, it's really just an enabler, but, but think of some of the things that are out there. Just like cloud, look what Amazon has done, right? They, they've, they've gone from brick and mortar to online, right? Then they had some excess capacity. Well, let's sell that as a business. I mean, very disruptive. And if you think about what that means for IT groups and just the industry at large, is that, wait a second, I don't know if I should have my infrastructure in-house anymore. Maybe I should go rent it, just buy it as a service. And they make it so easy you can pull out a credit card. You know? Or um, just the, the vendors, right? So think about the commercial vendors that are out there, of which I used to you know, kind of work for one of those. But if everybody is gonna buy it from a Amazon type vendor who really kind of gets component parts and puts us all together It just really disrupts that whole technology industry So it's I think it's just fascinating what's what's out there and how the um, the, the tables can be turned You know think of um, the, the whole trading you know stock, you know We used to buy and sell stocks. It was super expensive E-Trade now has done that for $20 a trade you know, look at what Kaiser is doing with healthcare. I mean, talk about an industry that just needs to be, you know, improved on. And Kaiser really is starting to do that where you can actually have a, you know, communicate with your doctor, you know, electronically, not have an appointment and so forth, and then work on how you really help someone out from a patient perspective as opposed to here's a procedure, here's how much I get paid for and so forth. So I think there's just a ton of opportunities out there. And I would say for the students, Go out there, find some pain point, you know, that's there. How can you really change, um, you know, using technology? Because it's just an enabler. But there's lots of things out there. I mean, and I hope there's no real estate agents in the audience, but, you know, there's, there's an example of an industry that's going to be disrupted, right? You know, just the commissions in the real estate industry. Look what Craigslist did to the newspapers. So there's lots of these things. So I just think it's a fascinating time here in uh, technology. It's really exciting. You know, I enjoy it, and there's a lot of these things out there, but go find a pain point, and I think you can, um, you know, you could be the next, uh, you know, billionaire in Silicon Valley. I'll go. I'll date myself, too. Um, there's got to be at least a few people out there that had to carry IBM carts to the uh, data center and play their transactions that way. Um, I think the interesting thing about the transitions that I've seen, and they're coming faster and faster uh, in the context of this session tonight, is that both for individuals, the interaction of the individuals 
has changed significantly with each major transition. I'll give you a couple examples, but um, it's it always expands to also change the business models um, that are out there. And in both cases, for the individuals and for the businesses, the large majority of these transitions are great equalizers. And I think that's really significant in the context of the globalization conversation. Um, because it really, the technology really has made the world a much, much smaller place and uh, offers tremendous opportunity for, you know, emerging countries or individuals who maybe didn't have an advantage that, that can come to the table differently. And it's so pervasive today because of the changing technology that, um, that the force comes the opposite direction, right? The, the, the force doesn't come from some big brainiac in some big company. It comes from all around the world and from individuals in different places. So a couple of big examples in my career. Um, when I first started, at, I worked for Amdahl, which was a mainframe company that no longer exists. Um, Cisco's the only company I work for that still exists. exists. Um, that tells you something about the valley. But, but uh, we used to write, I worked in planning, we used to write in our, in our MRP systems, which is what we ran all of manufacturing off of, we used to write down transmittals. And there was people that got paid more than we did to check the transmittals before they submitted them every evening. And you had to have them done like by two o'clock every day. So take that extreme of how we interacted with systems. I had the excellent fortune to be at Cisco in the mid 90s when the internet really started taking off as a way to do business, a way to do everything in your business, the way and most, most importantly, e-commerce, which changed um, all the business models that people had. And it became not just that change, but it started becoming the standard for technology transitions in terms of what things could change. And I think, um, you know, the big ones now that are, there's a lot of them, but the, the big ones now that are really obviously changing business models, mobility, changing around the world, you know, the, the idea that you can do microloans and, um, I have friends who regularly invest in little micro loans for people in emerging countries that are, you know, have some idea, right? And that that's made possible through mobility technology, but social technologies, um, different types of communication technologies that are available today and are really globally deployed. Um, and then uh, on the business side, just the concept of cloud. You, you mentioned Amazon as an example. Um, you know, Amazon is a company that disrupts almost every single business on the planet, um, in either in retail or in technology or whatever. Just the idea of what they could do possibly, not even what they can really do, but what they can do possibly, changes that whole paradigm of what businesses can do, how they can access resources that were previously unattainable because they were so expensive if you didn't have the capital uh, to do it. and. Um, you know, to me, there's other examples, but those are some big ones that are, you know, they change the paradigm for the individual and they change the paradigm for the countries. Um, and, uh, and the corporations are just trying to figure out how to stay competitive um, by figuring out which one of those transitions to take advantage of and how to do it. Uh, and I think that's just a huge aspect of business today. So um, the first piece of software that I wrote was stored on punched tape. If you guys remember that, it's this yellow chalky stuff that you have to feed into them. <laughs> so that's even before punch cards. Yeah, yeah thanks. <laughs> um, so the, the, I, I've been kind of lucky in that uh, pretty much every job or business that I've been in is in some way, shape, or form based on the use of, te the use of technology. I, I never really did the brick and mortar kind of thing. Um, and, and through the years, it's been absolutely fascinating seeing the growing leverage of the network. And thank you, Cisco, for that because they, they were a player right from the beginning. Um, I think that, that global businesses uh, have the ability to leverage technology that can transform their models. Uh, I know some very specific examples at Sony. We, you know, we had created a pretty compelling application uh, that was at first just deployed in the United States and we spoke to the United States audience. But we knew that in order for us to continue to grow, that we had to go, go global. Um, but what we found and what was really interesting about that effort is that you couldn't exactly do the same thing in every region and territory that you went into. Um, you had to actually work with local talent to help culturalize your application, not just translate it, because 
translation wasn't good enough. Um, but you had to culturalize it, and you had to deploy it locally too. So this is you know, 2000, 2001, we had to solve problems where we, how do you deploy thousands of servers all around the world and manage them from one place? Um, that was a difficult problem to solve back then. Um, how do you do it so that you, you're sure that, that when you deploy infrastructure, that it's being monitored correctly, that it's being maintained correctly, that, that you know, you're, you've got lights out data centers all halfway around the globe. Yeah, what kind of technologies can you use to make sure that that runs efficiently and effectively? Uh, and when it comes to actually leveraging talent in, in all of these different places, we had studios in Taiwan, in China, um, in Russia, uh, a couple of different countries. How do you work together? How do you work together on the same application? Um, let alone letting each of these little studios make their own thing, but how do you all work together um, to build these applications and, and provide culturalized content into those regions? Uh, that, that was a really, really fascinating experience. Um, and at the end, I think we did pretty well. We were launching titles on a global basis when, when, when I left there. Um, yeah. So I'm going to pile on a little bit, you know, but we've all been talking about change. I think that one of the interesting things, you know, in my career is what I've noticed that I don't know. I'm going to say has me a little bit in shock and awe when I think about it. Is how much the scope of what technology change is doing to our lives and our businesses has changed over the years. And so I'll give you a couple examples from, you know, even just what I've been working on, or even what Accenture's been working on. So, you know, early on in my career had a couple of projects you know, where we did things like, <clears throat> how do we add a mobile capability to Siebel? You know, there's information in there, I've got people who are gonna need it, and there's key pieces of information that maybe I want updated in real time you know, on a WAP application. And that was interesting and exciting. You know, and I'm gonna say similarly, you know, we did a project which I was very excited and proud of the time using digital pen technology with a, a Noto for an insurance company. So what we were trying to get them to be able to do is to be able to immediately digitize as they're doing claims, as they're taking on uh, <clears throat> you know, new customers, but how do I get it out of that physical realm and really push it into that digital realm? And all of those things are interesting and exciting and they're valuable and there's a business case behind them, but it's very different and not nearly as impactful as some of the things that people are asking for today. What technology is doing today is when you start to sum up the mobile, social, cloud, it's more than just that increment step change. Companies are actually being asked to reinvent themselves in this new world. So think about uh, somebody you would traditionally not think about as a technology company like Caterpillar. You know, Caterpillar makes large industrial equipment, uh, lining tools, backhoes, dozers, you, know, you name it, it's big in a construction site of the side of the street, Caterpillar probably makes it. And 10 years ago, if you asked Caterpillar who they were as a company, it's a very easy answer. We make industrial equipment. But you ask them today, and that answer is much more complicated. Is the, yes, they're still an industrial equipment manufacturer, but they're also a mobile company because they have a mobile device and a completely sensated piece of equipment that they're working with and interacting with. Suddenly, they're a, an analytics and predictive modeling company because they're pulling data constantly off of those machines to try to figure out how it's used, how it needs to maintain, and to predict failures before they happen. You know, suddenly they're using these new interactions that they have with the people who are using their tools in order to offer new services. And whether that's to automatically doze an area, or whether that's to take an enormous you know, flatbed truck with a huge amount of hand and you know, hand equipment, saws, hammers, jackhammers, and load it up to a web, load it up to a site, so that whatever somebody needs on that construction site to use that equipment, they go inside, grab it, it automatically understands that it's been used, and suddenly they've rented it for that day. So it's driving their businesses in a new way, but fundamentally they're being asked to how they can change technology from this support for how it makes me do my business, my business more efficiently to how do I use that to drive new business, new opportunities, and how does that redefine who they are you know, fundamentally as a company. And there are companies like CAT, you know, like the P&Gs of the world that are far along this path of really thinking that way, is 
But the interesting, exciting point where we're at right now is most companies are just starting to really internalize that that's the thing that they need to do in order to really push the envelope and differentiate themselves in the marketplace. Thank you. Those, those are good uh, <coughs> openers for looking at uh, you know, the things that we need to be working to co-create solutions for. What I'd like you to address next is something that you've been personally involved with where it worked really well. All of you mentioned changes, transformation, business models, uh, whether it's in the context of using technology to drive it or uh, you know, cultural adoption across the globe or the globe becoming smaller because of technology. What are some projects that you've been involved with where things worked really well? What are some of the best practices and solutions? <coughs> I'll, I'll go. Um, so over the last, um, well, I, yeah, I took the CIO job at Cisco about six years ago and, and uh, it was it's sort, of, sort of a little bit of a story that I had to get talked into taking the job. Um, but when I, and I came out of manufacturing and we had a tremendous number of operational challenges. Um, and in, in the um, IT area, we had, and manufacturing was operating pretty well, so also an operational function. Um, and uh, IT was having a lot of challenges operationally. And uh, I mentioned earlier that I'm not really a technologist, but um, I, you know, having a supply chain background, and you know, hopefully some of this will resonate with some of your MBA uh, courses. But uh, I have this idea that, um, you know, IT probably needed some basic operational processes, and they also had an issue where they didn't seem to understand asset utilization. Um, I had heard about something called virtualization, and to me, that sounded like an asset utilization strategy. Um, and uh, you know, I went into the IT organization and I asked them how how much of the data centers were virtualized, and they said twenty percent. And I said that's ridiculous. Um, now this is six years ago, and and what you might not know is that six years ago, a twenty percent virtualized data center for a company our size was leading edge. Um, and, you know, I, but I didn't get it because I had this idea that you were supposed to get better asset utilization. And by the way, they only got like you know, about 23% utilization out of the assets that they, that they even did, did have, right? Uh, and so we decided we were gonna go, and, this, and I think this is a good example because virtualization is one of the, um, it's not a, a, uh, tr it's a big transition that's happening right now and it's not one that everyone talks about because it's fundamental. It's not like, you know, it's part of cloud. Um, it's, but it do doesn't have the big buzzword so much associated with it, but it's fundamental to how you have to operate technology today to be able to operate globally, to be able to get the right asset utilization, um, frankly, to be able to get the kind of resiliency that you need in business, which every board of director member cares about more than anything else about my data center. And so we ended up with a big strategy to say we were going to change this. But what happened, and, and I think, you know, I, I partly use this example because it's technology, but partly it's a lesson in leadership, which is um, I said to the team, I just don't get it. This is ridiculous, you know. Of course, I always just say stuff like that. And the team said, well, you know, you don't get it because this fundamental change in technology changes everything about the way we run IT, everything. And this is one of the challenges with running an IT organization today, especially for an organization that's already established, is these changes in technology change everything about the way you, you measure yourself, the way you um, organize yourself. The traditional data center structure in an in a IT organization is very siloed by technology. You got the storage guys, you got the network guys, you got the, of course the network guys are the smartest ones, but, um, sorry, that's a Cisco joke. Um, and the, the, you have the server guys, you know, and, and, and so you have all these, the database guys, you know, you have these siloed technologies and they're technical experts. And that's not the way virtualization works if you do it right. You have a unified architecture that actually has a strategy where every time you need them, you, you bring the appropriate resources 
regardless of what kind of technology they are, you bring them to bear for whatever business purpose you're trying to achieve. And that is completely different in terms of the way you deploy the technology, the way you manage the technology, the way you measure your success. But but the thing that's interesting about it is it changed every business process we had in terms of how we ran IT. And it also, we had to do a lot of work to change the cultural structure of how we communicated, um, how we even did troubleshooting when we had a technical challenge, how we communicated with the business in order to um, apply the technology to solve their business problems. And so uh, that's been a multi-year journey where we've completely transformed um, from one architectural paradigm to another. Um, wildly successful, saved the company tons of money, made the board happy by uh, actually having real resiliency and, um, and a platform that we can build the future on and have really turned into a private cloud. So it's, a, it's kind of a, you got to fix a fundamental problem, you got to change not just the technology but the, the structure around it, story, uh, and at the end of the day you have to bring business value or else who cares. I'll, I'll go next. And I, I want to key in on one thing that, that, you, that you said uh, within that, and that's the, the business value piece at the end, is that it's really easy, specific, specifically as a technology guy, to get caught up in this idea that it's cool, it's interesting, it's new, or even if it works better from a technical perspective, that that's the reason in and of itself to use it. And I think more and more, what we're really seeing is that it's not IT who's driving the technology alone anymore. It's really a combination of how IT and the business really drive it together. And that becomes interesting from a, a couple of different reasons. And I'm going to say the, the first reason is that you start to get to do more interesting projects in that you've moved away from my sole goal is to how do I cut costs to how do I start to do and support the business to do interesting things. So an example that I'll throw out there is, is that, so we were working with a um, global uh, large industrial turbine manufacturer. Hidden, who, who, who does not allow me to say you know, who they are. You know, but the interesting part about it is that they came at it from a very different way from a technology perspective. Is that they started with the, we as a business need to grow, and here's an area that we need to grow into. So traditionally, a uh, vast majority of their business came specifically from just the sale of this industrial equipment. And the realization was that from a global perspective, they were global, that they were relatively flat in terms of their growth. And so they needed to get into a new market, a new area specifically, in order to be able to drive growth. And what they decided to do is that from a natural fit was to go into that aftermarket. So how do I start to maintain these things over a long term? So instead of being a one-time purchase, it becomes a one-time purchase plus yearly fees for five, 10, 20 years in order to maintain these things because by God, they have the experts who know more about these turbines than anybody else. And it was wonderful because you start with that, with the end in mind, then it becomes an engineering technical problem for how to solve it, not a question of whether or not if I do something new, eventually I'll find some value and use for it. And so what they did and what we helped them do was to build a remote monitoring system that said, how do I take all the sensors and data off these things, pull it back, get it to the experts so that you have the people who are actually built and designed these things watching them, monitoring them, and figuring out when they're going to fail before they actually fail. And this is how they're using it to drive and grow their business, and it becomes a much simpler and easy way to, easier way to look at the problem if you can start with the business first, <clears throat> and then have business folks who understand enough about what the technology is available out there to know what the opportunities of things that are even in the realm of possibility. <coughs> And I think that becomes a really interesting challenge for you know, most of the folks in these rooms in that, yes, you may not be in the IT department. Yes, you may not be the technology person. But more and more, it's going to become a part of your job to understand the technology out there because that's what's going to give you the tools and that's what's going to give you the powers in order to do new things. I, I, uh, I don't know if anybody in the audience has had to kind of drive uh, collaboration 
any kind of collaboration projects out there? How, how many have been successful at those? Raise the other hand. Yeah, it, it, it's it's one of those those things that's really tough. And um, you know what we did at at, um, at VMware, it, it helps that we bought the product. But but what we um, ended up doing is is uh, there's a, there's a, a tool we had, and it was SocialCast, and you know there's other ones out there. But one of the, the difficulties we had is it was all this one-to-one -one communications, email, and so forth. So we acquired this company, and you know, the day after the, the press release is out, they asked me, well, why isn't this rolled out? You know, of course, you know, Mark, you know, we bought this company. Why, why aren't you rolling this out? You know, I didn't talk about the, you know, the one we bought the quarter before and the quarter before and the quarter before that. But um, so what we did is we did a pilot with this, and I think it was just a, a question of, of timing, you know, but it, uh, it really stuck. And we got all uh, employees, 95% of the employees on this in four months. It was just phenomenal how we, we were able to do it. I think part of it was the familiarity. It was just like social cast, or I'm sorry, just like Facebook. So everybody was accustomed to it. And we, and we tried to set it up in, in you know, that consumer experience, what you have at home, and how you might bring that into the enterprise. And, uh, and then we started using it in, uh, in projects in IT. So we uh, had a, a bring your own mobile device. So I was get, kind of getting squeezed. My CFO was saying, why are we spending all this money on cell phones? And then I had all my uh, business partners saying, well, you only offer an Android and an iPhone and, and a Blackberry, but not 12 options of each. And, and I would get all these, um, these requests um, about um, every time an iPhone was shipped, I get like 100 emails about broken phones, lost phones, and so forth. It was just a coincidence, right? So we decided, I'm going to get out of the business. This just makes no sense whatsoever. So it was the first time we actually used SocialCast. So I, we, we created a stream, and we just sent a note out. Said, hey, you know, we're going to go to a BYOM program. You know, it's all about freedom and choice, and on and on and on. And there was that small group that said, hey, this is really cool. I can go buy mine. But then there was the, other, there was the others that I had to, uh, to kind of deal with. But what was interesting, you know, after all the love letters I got for the first few weeks, is that we had a little tide turned. And he said, well, gosh, you know, um, AT&T is having a special. Verizon, you can get unlimited data. So the, suddenly the, all the 12,000 employees started collaborating and working together on this, um, you know, on this project because it was, we, we, we were going to do it. And, and we rolled out in 90 days. I mean, VMware was you know, pretty quick in, in terms of doing things. But I got all US employees on this um, BYOM in 90 days, right? Saved the company a ton of money, but we kind of proved this out, and then we started using it in other areas, like the sales organization. I'm going to be calling on Accenture, right? Does anybody know anyone over at Accenture? And boom, you could start getting the power of the group to kick in and say, "Oh yeah, well, gosh, I know this guy at Accenture. You know, maybe he he can um, help you out." So you just started getting all this, and it was when we got away from mail, and, you, and the email volume just dropped down. And we got into um, you know quite a bit of uh, collaboration, and, and you could set up like a little stream, or you could have like the, the um, you know the the main stream that was going on. But it was just an interesting way of collaboration to see the uh, employees, and we had to moderate it. I mean, you always had the folks who had the you know the the wisecrack comments and so forth, and that's okay. But I think it's good. I'd rather have that that feedback. What's going on in the company? What's going on in the organization? as opposed to the silent folks. And one of the things that we started doing is that we would alternate live and virtual all hands for my IT groups. And I would find these folks that, who is that guy? He's asking all these great questions, coming up with all these suggestions. So it's just something that we did. And I think it was a familiarity. And then everybody, you know, it was a change management thing, but we were able to really channel the organization around this and just give them a tool. You know, and um, so I don't know, I, 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 I had used, I'll say prior technologies I won't mention on collaboration was less than successful. But I think it's that consumer, it's something they're familiar with, bring it into the enterprise. And I think that's what we have as IT professionals. You, know, you have a lot of these systems that have these Soviet air interfaces and they, are you kidding? I'm not gonna use these things. And what we have to do is we have to bring that experience. We have to make it easy to use that it truly is a tool as opposed to something that I have to use. So, um, really great success story. Uh, goes back to something I was mentioning before, which is the sort of globalization of one of our main products when I was working at Sony. Um, the, the challenge was how do you actually deploy uh, 
12 different data centers around the world, um, be able to manage it all centrally, be able to remotely monitor and maintain it uh, without having people on the ground there. Um, uh, and, and, and this kind of goes to, to something mentioned before around gathering data and be able to crunch it in a sort of centralized location and provide meaningful real-time insight to actual consumers of that data, most of which were not technology people. Um, so we, we went about you know, addressing the issue in a couple different layers, one about provisioning, one about monitoring, um, one about uh, actually how do, you, how do you build software that works in that environment well. Uh, and, and the success was, was at, uh, I believe we reached the point of success when, when I knew that people in our marketing department and, and partners who, who were working in region were using this common tool chain to be able to see how the, the application was behaving in their region. Even though it was all kind of maintained and monitored and, and centralized from a management perspective in one location. Um, uh, that, that was very powerful. That, that meant that it actually really didn't matter where the stuff was at all. Um, uh, it could be everywhere and you could still touch it as if it was right next to you. Uh, and gather information from it and provide it to decision makers and stakeholders uh, in real time, uh, any, any time you wanted to. Uh, that, that, was, that was pretty cool. Thank you. Those, those are wonderful stories. And they, um, in my mind, make it clear that we as a group in this conversation can spark in, um, things that will have major impact and change and create the future that uh, we want to be seeing. Um, I'm going to direct the next question to Mike. Um, and um, yeah, Mike, you had mentioned that you produce a report that looks at the future trends in technology over the next three to five year range. And as Mike presents what his research shows on the potential future trends, I then also want the other panelists to think about and talk to us about what are the future challenges that you see um, that we might have possible co-creation happening with solutions for those for you in the room. And um, I'll, I'll start by mentioning two things that um, I've been studying or following in the last couple of years. One is in the industry that I work in, education, the massively open classrooms, uh, Coursera and edX, are two of the fastest growing companies in the history of business. No other company has ever grown as rapidly as these companies are growing. So something's definitely shifting because of technology there. And we are keeping an eye, trying to figure it out, make it up as we go. The other was the Fulbright work I did in India, studying Jugaad, the Indian practice of fast and frugal innovation with creative improvisation. And that has reduced costs for certain things by more than 90%. The rate at which new innovations are coming from India and China is much greater than the rate at which innovations were coming out of Japan 30 years ago. So uh, more than 200 <coughs> Fortune 500 companies have moved their R&D operations with labs in India, uh, which means that India will develop more capability in doing fundamental research, and that can have serious implications. So we in Silicon Valley think that we sit here and do things that change the world, but on the other side of the world, they sit and do things that change our lives here too. Um, so that's what's keeping me worried about the future and wanting to pursue these conversations. So with that, Mike, tell us about the future trends. So I'm not going to tell you about all of them, but I'm going to pick one. Um, so since, since I'm talking to an audience that um, is not necessarily all, all IT people, I'm going to take one of the ones that I think that you guys are probably more familiar with some of the technology, is that I don't think there's anybody in this room, and I guess that there's not anybody in this room, I hope there's not in this room, that hasn't realized that mobile and social have changed the way that people interact with each other. You know, um, you know, we started the conversation with that kind of as a, a general backdrop, but I want you to think about it in a slightly different way. In that, have you guys as executives ever wondered why is it that 
businesses should care about something like Facebook. I mean, we use it for our personal lives, you know, our, our friends, our kids, you know, we manage, you know, a, a lot of the interactions we do in our lives, but the reality is, is that, you know, Accenture has a version of Facebook and I don't use it. You know, most companies are looking at social technology and realizing that it's interesting and exciting because there's a billion people who are using it, but for the most part, there's this question mark that says, why do we care? So this is the way I want you to think about it differently. What is social technology? What does Facebook really do? The innovation, and I think what's truly amazing about what Facebook has done, is they've given us a way to manage our relationships digitally. Now think about that, is that when I was in high school, I had my five friends, my 10 friends, the 15 people, you know, my friends and family that I religiously kept up with. Now, when you start looking at people who are using social media, it's a matter of saying that anywhere between 250 friends to 1,000 people are the folks that I'm actually following, talking to, and managing my relationship. And that's interesting. And that's why they're as big and important as they are. But from a corporate perspective, it's the fact that I now have a billion people who now expect to have the relationship with them managed digitally. Entire companies, entire industries, think about the insurance industry, have been built on maintaining a relationship with their customers. You know, you know your insurance agent, they were local, and that's how and why you chose Allstate, or you chose whoever it was that was going to be your pharmacist or your banker for your home loans. And with the advent of technology, we traded that relationship for scale. But we're at a really interesting juncture right now. We're using technology and using these types of techniques. We have the ability to potentially go both ways that says I can get the scale and I can start to actually reform real relationships with my clients to drive loyalty, to drive trust, which eventually will lead to sales. And that's gonna be a very interesting paradigm when you see you know, the Burberries of the world who you walk in and suddenly you know, the sales attendant has a history of everything you've ever bought in their hand. And why are they doing that? They do that because they want them to have an understanding of how you interact with the company, what was the last thing that you did, and turn that into a personal interaction back and forth with them. But we're at a very interesting time and in that we know that it's possible, but we're still trying to figure out how it's done and where you're gonna see a lot of this push, especially in the B2C type of consumer technologies, is people trying to figure out how they can master that because it's a new paradigm, it's a new world, and now people are really starting, just now started to push towards it. I'm not worried at all. This is great. <laughs> um, uh, very interesting comments about, about Facebook and managing personas. So I, I've had digital interactions and digital relationships with people for, for very, very long since college, really. Um, uh, and and to me, it's I, I find it always fascinating when when people do ask the question why, because well, how else would you do it actually? You know, the, my, my, my network of people that I interact with, uh, both on a professional and, and a personal level, have been global for quite some time. Um, uh, and, and the sort of consumerization of that digital management it feels very, very natural to me. Um, so, pretty much for the last, since Facebook was around, that I can think of, um, uh, every company that I worked with has in some way, shape, or form tried to leverage digital social interactions. Uh, at, at Sony, it was about um, basically multi-user dungeons, which are big glorified chat channels where we had players who were played together from around the world. Um, so, so not only do we, do we not ask why, we, we said, well, how can we do more? Um, how, can we, how can we make the experience of managing your digital relationship even better? Um, either through gameplay or through things that were sort of outside or meta to the, to the gameplay. 
Um, at Bill Me Later, that, that the, the relationship between vendors and merchants and their consumers um, was, was strengthened by a digital relationship. Um, the, what we did was we made transactional credit decisions, decisions within three seconds, roughly, to whether or not to give you credit to purchase something at the point of sale, at the digital point of sale. Um, and kind of sort of soon to be physical. Um, but the, the, the merchants loved it because, because what wound up happening is there was a network effect. Um, the, the consumers who would use the product would talk about it and they'd ask, well, where else can I use it? And then it just kind of snowballed from there. Um, so, that, so the ability for, for these merchants to be able to leverage their, their digital relationships was, was absolutely incredible uh, to discuss of that particular kind of product. Um, a blurb, uh, very interesting things going on now with respect to um, uh, trying to figure out how best to leverage this wave of what we now call ebooks. Um, uh, you know, there, there's not a lot of business models. You know, you're just starting to see some of it. Um, what we're trying to figure out right now is how do you create that right kind of form and marketplace, to, and how do you enable people to both sell and share um, digital curated content. Uh, and, and you know it's, it's a little bit of a wild west right now. The, the standards aren't very firm, and there's lots of different kind of devices and lots of different ways of consuming content. Um, well, you know the, the problems that we're trying to solve right now is, regardless of what those endpoints are, how do we create the, the right kind of platform to allow folks to be able to to share um, digital content with each other? Um, that's kind of interesting stuff going on. Right now. So I, I think as a business. Um, there's a huge amount of opportunity inherent in in the technology change that you're talking about. There's a, you know, anything around collaboration, social, mobile. I would add video to the list. Um, has a, a, it sort of has this effect of shrinking time and space, and so it, it has some opportunity in that. In that you're. You know your target market it, it's the biggest opportunity for businesses the target market in a digitized world is larger it it's going to scale faster the scale is almost incomprehensible because it's shrinking that time and, and space where you can reach your target market um, so there's this huge inherent opportunity in that and um, and it, it almost creates a common language around the world so uh, you know it's it, you can kind of you don't really have to speak exactly the same language and you can you can kind of participate so it has this huge opportunity associated with it um, and people that it's changed the way you expect to interact with businesses it changes the way your employees expect you to interact with them it changes um, it changes the way people interact um, here's what the challenge is is it's still it's still a fight for relevance so if you're a business and you you know, figure out how to use these technologies. It doesn't mean you're relevant. How many people, how many people go into their email and delete more than 10 emails at a time on a regular basis? So that's, you know, that's because everyone sends you an email and you cannot figure out how to get off their mailing list. And, you know, you just go in and you delete it before you look at anything else. I get one relevant email for every hundred emails I get on my home email. I get a little better percentage at work, but not a lot. And and so the, all the social media is the same way. I mean, I like to go on Facebook. I use it on a personal basis. I, I don't really. I have a lot of friends from work, but I don't you really use it as a work thing. But you know, now that they're advertising and stuff, I just skip right by that stuff. You know, I don't look at it. And, and I think for all of us as consumers, it's about how, you know, what is actually relevant and how do you do that and what actually builds trust. I mean, putting an ad on Facebook doesn't necessarily build trust. So, you know, there are technologies that can help with that. The idea that you could uh, capture somebody in a service call and click to chat and turn that into a video chat, um, you're going to get a higher level of trust when you see somebody um, than when you're just talking to them. Um, you're, you know, and so there's some technologies that can help with that, but the real challenge for businesses is not the technology itself. The technology doesn't do anything. It, the technology is something that you bring to bear to add value in a broader context. And, um, and I think that's, there's a couple of things 
that you have to understand as a business is the same thing's not relevant to everybody. Um, you know, we have we talk about this quite often. We have four generations in the workplace. Um, we worry about a certain generation of engineers gets pissed off if you want to put seat them in a collaborative workspace. You hire a bunch of college hires, you leave the room, they tear the cubes down. They don't ask permission. This is a real story. That's really happens. You put them in the room, they take all the they take all the top part off the cube. Whereas you know your older engineers are like, you can't make me sit that close to another human being. You know, it's it's a you know you have to and you have to cater to that full gamut of employees, that full gamut of customers around the globe. And so it's it's a, two things are really important in that relevance, and it, apart from the actual value proposition that you have, in addition to that, you have to deal with the speed of innovation. For you to stay relevant, you better keep innovating. You have to have some way to keep innovating around your products, your service, the way you interact, something, you have to, that speed of innovation you can your business can get destroyed on Facebook in about ten minutes, um, you know. So how do you how do you do that, right? And then um, uh, the other piece of it is how do you create something that feels like customization to somebody it, and still be able to scale it? How does that person feel like they're having a personal interaction? And that probably takes some combination of technology and some other um, kind of interaction. We've learned that we've been using collaboration for. For years, we've experimented with everything, and what we find is these hybrid interactions are phenomenally uh, productive and relevant and um, meaningful to people. And just a digital transaction isn't really uh, enough to hold people. It's it's very easy to walk away from. Uh, it's kind of like once you look somebody in the eye, you can't really you know, just walk away from them. But when you have a digital transaction with them, you might not even know if they were really what they said they were. So it's kind of a, an interesting phenomenon, I think, for us to be able to deal with in business. Yeah, I, I think what's interesting, um, just kind of following the social thing, is the power of one. You know, if, if you think in the past, if you were unhappy with the company, you may have sent them, uh, you may have called their call center or sent a letter to their CEO, and you know, what's the likelihood that you would have got a response? If you go tweet that, and then somebody says, I have that problem, and so forth, suddenly it goes viral. I don't know, you know, way back when there was that um, YouTube video where the guy was unhappy with his, uh, an airline, how they handled his baggage, and the airline didn't even have a, a uh, department that dealt with that, you know? So this thing went viral, millions of kind of views, and they were kind of clueless. So I think it, what, what's, uh, I'll say, empowering for the consumer is power of one is big. You know where it wasn't wasn't before. You actually do have a uh, you do have a voice, and I say when you cater to them, the challenge to you is to make that uh, a kind of one to one personal kind of relationship. And there's so much noise, you know, kind of out there. So it's a great opportunity, you know, kind of once again is that I think your voice will be heard, you know, if if there's something that you're saying that you know others would agree with, and then I think the challenge, you know, catering to you is how do you make that. How do you make that uh, a value to me and, and cut through the noise? Thank you. I will open the floor up to questions now. Jackie has a mic somewhere, so if you can ask your question in the mic, we'll capture the question as well as the answer. Successful, um, but they want you know a good pilot that has that has proof. What do you recommend for people who are uh, directors, senior directors, VPs who are trying to implement change in their organizations um, to help you know make the business case to executives who are trying to figure out how to, how to navigate this change? Can you also introduce yourself as you ask the question? Thank you. I am I'm Jocelyn King. I'm head of marketing at Altera Corporation. And I am an alumni of the Trans Global MBA program at St. Mary's College. 
general change, general change or implementing technology? Utilizing technology change, like the hybrid collaboration. So a lot of companies, sure. you know, want to, you know, be, uh, you know, fast, uh, fast followers of all the great work that everybody on this panel has already done, and be able to put a cost-effective pilot in for their organization. But they don't necessarily want to do all the lab work and discovery themselves. So how, how can we leverage the work that? you and the other leaders in the industry. Sure. Um, so there's a there's a couple of elements of change that are just about any kind of a change um, that I just would mention because I could talk about that for about three hours. But, um, you know, if you're going to have a change, if you're going to take an organization through a change, um, the first thing you have to have is a destination. Um, and you can have you can call it a vision, you can call it a charter, you can call it whatever you want to call it. We happen to use uh, a construct at Cisco that we call a VSEM, so it's a one-page document that has your vision, uh, a very summary of your strategy, and then your main execution items for the next 18 months, and then your metrics or your measures of success for that. It's just a one-pager that is an easy way to say to your organization, "This is your, um, this is where we're going," um, and I think. Uh, an element, you know, if you have a construct like that and you want to use technology to do it, you should be explicit about saying, we're going to use, one of our strategies is, we're going to use a, a, kind of a set of technologies to go fulfill this vision. We, we see it as interlocked. We don't see it as a separate project. We don't see it as whatever. We see it as a, a portion of what we're doing and it's a pillar of our strategy, uh, I think is pretty important. Um, I think it's also important to give people a construct of the journey. Here's where we've been and why we were successful doing that. I think you always have to honor the past. Um, it doesn't help anybody to alienate the past. Um, you have to say here's where we're at and then here's where we're going. So why that becomes important, it's important in general, but why that's important in technology is it's not very productive to do what a lot of companies do today, which is act like the young people think the experienced people are idiots and the, and the uh, experienced people just think the young people are irresponsible. Uh, that doesn't create like where you're going, right? So if you can kind of create the journey and then you engage, you, you create both, both um, human in, regular human interaction and digital interactions um, to be able to bring those kind of different points of view together at opportune moments, you kind of have to make a plan for doing that. You have a strategy for doing that. You say, so a good example of that that we've done in Cisco IT is uh, we decided, you know, we, we, I'll give you two stories about how we did this with social media at the very beginning. Six years ago, in addition to the virtualization conversation, the other big conversation we were having is, you know, Cisco IT had had a reputation during the internet era for being too, super leading edge and we had lost it because we kind of got stuck in Okay, that was great, we were very successful at that, and now we're gonna write it for 10 years or something, right? And one of the big conversations was, you guys don't have a clue about you know, the social technologies that are coming on board. And by the way, six years ago, the, the social technologies were really not very much. You know, It was like, the whole conversation was, you don't know how to do wikis and blogs, right? And it wasn't Facebook and Twitter and, you know, and all of these kinds of things, and so we, what we did was we said, okay, what, what are we gonna do? We, we aren't gonna overnight become pros at this. Um, we can't not do it because it's just gonna, we're just gonna become irrelevant. And so we said, we're gonna actually use the technology. I partnered with um, our communications leader who now runs marketing for us. Um, and we, we created just a simple website using wiki technologies and so on saying, hey, everybody here is so much smarter than us, we want to invite you to tell us what to do. Tell us what re technologies to research. Tell us what you're using. Tell us what's most relevant to you. Um, and we changed uh, like sort of the, the kind of paradigm of saying, okay, we've got 15 things we're reviewing, we're checking them all out, we're doing a proof of concept, and then we'll tell you guys what to do later. We said, <laughs> you know, we created a standard on wikis by basically polling the company who's using what. Here's the one the most people are using. We're going to standardize on that and virtualize it so we can actually scale the use of it. 
Um, and, and so we invited, you know, other people into it that weren't traditionally in it using both the technology and other things. So this, this was sort of a general thing we did. We also, we ultimately have a program where we hire college students. Uh, we sit them together. We re have use reverse mentoring with the senior people in the IT team so we can learn. And you know what's amazing is we've hired a couple of geniuses doing this that are going to be our best innovators going forward. So, you know, those are that's a couple examples of how you do that. But you, you have to bring together things. And then the third thing I would suggest is um, you need to pilot something that demonstrates real business value. And in case you haven't got this, my theme is you know, technology doesn't matter if it's not bringing you business value. You you can do some experimentation, but you got to have a path to business value uh, from there, right? And and so uh, you know what you do is you go find a business partner. And by the way, this is true with fundamental technologies. This is true with uh, newer technology, social technology, or whatever. You find the one business partner that has a burning need, and you get you become partners with them and you go, look, I got some ideas technology wise and you got some problems to solve and maybe we can get together and solve those problems together. And you know, that again, that works for fundamental technology, works forever. I got again, an example of that in the room with a fundamental technology. I don't know if Chris left, but um, you know, Chris Snow runs Cisco Capital for us. And that was a really small, nothing business for us, which she has made into a tremendous business, but they didn't even have fundamental um, ERP type functionality that was scalable. They're pretty much running the thing off spreadsheets. And we've been wondering about that for years, but we didn't really have a business partner. And so my team and her team got together and eventually you create, it, it's a hand in hand transformation of her business with the technology. And you just find somebody in your business that has that kind of a challenge and, and make it happen. And it's amazing once it works, how many people flock to success. So I, that's maybe a long explanation, but th those are the three things I would try. Yeah, so I'll, I'll add a, a couple simple things to that. So the business value is what's going to get you funding. Um, making sure there's something in it for everybody is what's going to get it adopted. So you got to make sure that whatever you're pushing out, that it makes people's job easier. If it doesn't make their job easier, they're not going to do it. And then I, I throw out the last thing, which is, I think something that most companies are still grappling with is that the day you deploy it, whether it's your pilot or whether it's your full deployment, that's not the end of the journey, that's the beginning of the journey. Is that you're never going to get the answer right the first time. It doesn't matter how smart you are, how many times you, you know, what data you looked at, how many consultants you hired, you're never going to get it right the first time. You have to assume that the way that you're going to get to that right solution, whatever it might be, is going to be how you iterate it. So how you instrument it, how you collect the data, how you collect the opinions, how you involve the people that are using it and the people that are getting value, and then be able to change it as rapidly as you can in order to get to an optimal solution. It really is a journey. One thing, you know, I just would, would make one add-on to this that I think all MBA students should be aware of, which is um, it's a good goal to make everything make somebody easier. But in every country on earth, there are regulatory reasons why you need to embed controls in your systems. And it's an ongoing battle for IT leaders because a big part of our job is risk management. But really, we need more business leaders that actually understand risk management and know how to make those trade-offs. Um, because you really do have to be compliant and it doesn't matter if it makes your life easier or not. Um, on some things. So that's the only exception I would make to that. And the only reason I make the point is because it's an MBA audience and you guys should know that. Uh, hi, my name is Rahul Chajre. I'm a, a technical architect uh, for UOP. And my question is uh, to Mike. Uh, the panelists started uh, talking about the technology innovation. And while it is great, it is always accessible to the part of the world, very limited part of the world most of the time. Uh, how do you see in the future uh, the technology as the technology and access improves and uh, hopefully it reaches to the people at the base of the economic pyramid? How does it transform the life of the people? So there, there's actually a couple things, interesting things going on uh, in, in parallel, which I think is uh, really going to help drive this. Is that 
know, uh, Mark mentioned earlier this idea of uh, personalization. And one of the interesting pieces is that it's not just personalization in terms of I can market segment you know, something like the US. It's this idea that if you really want to get that answer right, it's about understanding what those people are trying to accomplish. And people, are, I think, are just starting to now you know, to really internalize that as they're looking to go to uh, India, China, South America, when they're going to these new emerging markets, is that it's not a matter of how do I port the things over, it's a matter of how do I personalize it and change the things fundamentally because you're talking to a different audience with different expectations. And what I think is really interesting and exciting is the fact that there are things that are fundamentally different across the board you know, in these emerging economies. And one of them is this idea that the numbers are big in terms of the potential because there's a large number of folks doing it, but the amount that on a per person or a per service basis is much, much smaller. But when you start looking at these digital technologies, cloud and virtualization and software-defined networking, is that a lot of these things are pushing to make it more flexible and more scalable. But as you get to that enormous scale, because you can scale so fast, is that you've got a stronger and stronger ability in order to reduce that initial cost to a low basis. And so I think what we're about to see is we're about to see a flood of new people who are not going to take US technology or you know, first world technology and push it to these emerging markets but rather we're going to see a proliferation of some of these base services, and whether it's Amazon or you know, others, that are going to be used in very innovative way that are combined the strengths of those areas. So whether it's you know, cheap labor and some of, the, you know, some of these cheap technologies to come up with some creative things. So I don't think that we're going to see a lot of similarities in growth, but I think we're going to see a lot of these base technologies pushing things you know, in parallel paths in different markets. You know, and this goes a little bit to the frugal technology, you know, the frugal, frugal engineering that we were referring to earlier. I, I, I'll bring you the perspective from my colleagues in India. They objected to the use of the word or the phrase bottom of pyramid. They said it's bottom of the pyramid if you only measure things in economic terms because they are poor. But they're very creative. Out of necessity is born this tremendous creativity and resilience that makes them at the top of the creativity pyramid. So you're right, they might come up with things, and they already have. There are many examples. The most well-known one is the $200 baby sleeping bag, which substitutes for the $200,000 incubators that are used in the hospitals here that can run with without a source of power and are culturally sensitive to the way people want to be carrying babies. And that's just one of the hundreds of examples. Hi, I'm Chris Magpeo, and I'm a senior business leader at Visa in the Emerging Products Group. And in the beginning of the discussion, many of you had spoken about how you had launched some new products and initiatives and were able to take them to scale. I don't know if you'd be interested in sharing any challenges that you may have encountered in scaling those products, going from pilot to uh, full commercial product? I, th I think you want to uh, small, uh, start small, fail small, you know, I, because I think if you, if you go through all the time and trouble and so forth to get something perfect, somebody else will get it out. So I, I think I, I would just go for speed. Experiment, if something sticks, then you build on it. But I don't think you necessarily want to have the perfect uh, product because the perfect product is gonna to be too late to market. So that, that goes to this concept of agility, right? So you, as you build a product, you have to build it in such a way that you can change it really, really fast if you need to. And differentiate it to speak to those sort of personalization issues that The interesting thing about my own experience is that we never had a chance to pilot anything. As soon as you let it out in the wild, it was global. Um, so, so we didn't actually get that opportunity. But we built things in such a way that we could change and adapt them very, very quickly and be able to sort of release new software or, or, or launch something in a, in a particular region very, very fast, which is actually critical. 
to, I'll throw a, a caveat and then, a, yeah, to start with the caveat is that, you know, the reality is, if you said you worked for your visa, so I can imagine that it, you know, agile in terms of a philosophy is something that companies need to think about, but they need to be tempered with the types of things that they're going to do with it. Because yeah. there realistically are things that are so mission critical that you need that five nines of availability time and you need to make sure that it's perfect. But, and I'm going to say this is a big but because there's a lot of folks that <clears throat> don't quite realize this yet, is that that's not everything. How you, especially when you start talking about how you interact and your user experience and how you're using these services, is that those are the things that Agile methodology is perfect for because you really are trying to create that good experience in order for people to adopt these things. And so there's really this balance you know, that people have to go through that says, the waterfall is gonna make sense and that's gonna be fine for how you're going to process a credit card transaction. But the user experience as to how people are going to interact with that, how the stores are gonna do it, how you're going to access that information, how you're gonna pay your bills, and all of those types of things, is those are things you have to realize that you have much more flexibility on and that you should be experimenting and you should be looking for new ways in order to do those things bigger, bigger and do them very, very quickly. I was also going to say, um, Michael's absolutely right. You know, the, the core of your system at Visa is something you don't want to change. That's where all kind of control. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, uh, one thing that's also that sort of goes hand in hand with with the concept of being able to move fast and being nimble is is testing and learning and sort of building architectures that allow you to do that, that you've instrumented things as you pilot them and as you release them so that you're getting the right kind of information back to, to be able to make fast decisions. So, you know, there's lots of folks that can build things in an agile fashion, but if you're not building into that, the process of testing and learning, it's not gonna do you any good. I think you just made a great point that most business people don't like to use the word architecture very much. Um, and I, I built a house a couple years ago, and the, the architect hated the fact that I used the term architecture relative to technologies. Like, that's not architecture. Architecture is art. Um, but I think the importance of thinking about the logic of how you put together your business, pro both your business processes and your technology, and how they fit together is really important even in any part of business, but super important in new product introduction because it is what gives you agility at the end of the day. You, you, you're, gonna, you're gonna have to have some of this foundational stuff that has to scale, and, but you, you put it together in a way that you can almost modularly you know, use and move parts around and configure them kind of in a way that feels customized to somebody. And you, can't, you don't wanna take that to an extreme, but you gotta find the right mix of that for whatever your product is so that you can have a fundamental offering but then you can add on to it and not turn that into a hairball you know that later on you can't keep changing because you you built all this layers around it right and i think we've all anybody that's ever worked for a company of any size has lived with that reality but i think we know now that if you can architect against that uh, if you put enough forethought into it. Yeah, I, oh, go ahead. I'm just going to add, add one more thing you know, on top of that. And this is a, a little bit of a, a, of a reiteration. You know, but you know, most people design their applications now purely for the functionality. And, and I think that the, the real next evolution is to realize that your application is there as much to gather the data to answer your next questions as it is to do whatever it's trying to accomplish. So I think a large piece of that agility is understanding that and understanding that that's some of your base requirements of how you're going to be building the system in order to be able to make those next steps. And if that's slower as necessary, that's still fine. You know, but regardless, is that if you're not getting that data, you're never going to make that next change. Hi, my name is uh, Jagan Subramanian. I'm actually a current student of uh, Trans Global Executive MBA program at St. Mary's. Uh, this question is actually directed at uh, Rebecca and Mark. Um, it's actually the uh, topic that Mike alluded to 
uh, what if uh, you know IT leaders like me, our constant challenge is bringing business along with us. And as CIOs, you know, what are some of your advices to us in bridging the business and technology organizations as a single aligned vision for the company? Uh, so first of all, IT has to recognize that they live to bring business value, um, not to bring technical value, to bring, now our expertise is technical. So we bring technology to bear to bring business value. And when you are, if that's why we exist, it, it doesn't mean, businesses hate IT organizations that are servants. You serve the business, but you serve them as a partner, not as a servant. Um, that doesn't, it just doesn't work. So I think that's a, there's an important mindset there to be an equal business partner to bring technology to bear to do that. But the very first thing, the, you know, I, I tell, I've told my guys forever and I still tell them, the number one thing we have to work on is the way we communicate. And um, there's a lot of things that IT people do that are um, challenging to communicate to a business. You know, starting with, you kind of want to explain everything. I don't really don't want to know everything. I only want to know the salient points. And, you know, especially the higher up I am in the organization, I don't have time to, to just know how much you know. I just need to know what I need to know. And, and so there's a whole communication thing, but the point I would emphasize above all else is it isn't natural for IT professionals to communicate in the language of business, which is dollars and cents, or whatever currency you happen to be living in. It's, and so an example is, this, this is an industry problem, and I actually speak a lot about this on an industry level, is, Right now we're transitioning to this cloud-based services. And it's really easy for my business partner to go to anybody who's selling any kind of cloud service, doesn't matter if it's actually viable or not, and they will tell them, for X amount of money, I will do this for you and this is the service you'll get. Um, and in IT, we go, let me spend a couple of months figuring out the project and getting your requirements document ready and um, and you know, then we're going to figure out how to do this. And I'm not going to really tell you how much it's going to cost to run it at the end of the project, but I can tell you how much the project's going to cost to do exactly what you asked for, as opposed to you know what you're really trying to accomplish. And so we have to figure out that we're in business. We're in business to sell the IT services, and so you better put it together. Your service. You better know the cost of your service. You better know how you're going to uh, what service levels you're going to offer, what features you're going to offer, who is your target market, what are they going to use it for, could you use it for other reasons, you know, you have to just think like you're developing a product. And we've done a, a multi-year transition to what we call a services structure. I've heard, um, I've had colleagues in other um, companies that I've talked to that have done the same thing, only they actually call it a product structure. Um, and how do we actually put that together differently, but how do we talk about our costs? How do we talk about our um, value in terms of the dollars and cents of the business and what the other things that the business cares about, like, uh, you know, time, productivity, growth, uh, you know, revenue, those types of things. And most IT professionals aren't very good at translating what their job responsibility is to what that means to the business. And that's just the number one thing we have to do differently. As a CIO, you have two jobs. One is to help the company build new products and services as rapidly as possible. And then the second is how do you have a, a great experience with your customers? Those are really the two things that you should be focusing in on as a CIO. Now we're expected to have good service, you know, you know the day-to-day -day kind of things in, in IT. You're judged on delivery, right? So you got to deliver your on your programs. So at, at the M, where you know 80% of our things were on growing the business. So we had ROIs with revenue. So somebody would sign up for revenue to get a project done, and then we had to deliver it. So we really turned a group around. We, we had an 89% um, on schedule for our, our projects. You know, the last few years, our customer sat was in the 90%. It's all about delivery. 
So you can get you can get a lot of uh, slack, if you will, if you say you're going to do something and you deliver it. Because I say, as, as an industry, we're not that great at delivering projects. But but that would be my suggestion. Think about two things that you do, and deliver your projects. I have the hard job of keeping the eye on the clock, so um, it's time for us to conclude this. Any last comments from any of the panelists? I, I would just say it's, it, once again, fascinating time in technology. The, the possibilities are unlimited. So, um, you know, I just wish you all well. And, um, you, know, I, you know, it's just a great place to be. And I just think of all the things that are out there. And, you know, I, I, I'm sure there's a few billionaires sitting in their room here in just a matter of years. I would just add that, um, Technology is probably a portion of your job, regardless of, of uh, what position you, you end up being in. I think if you're not thinking about how to bring technology to bear uh, to solve your business challenges and opportunities, um, you're leaving something big out of your toolkit. So I would just encourage all of you to leverage that in your obvious future success. And good luck. Make friends with your IT. <laughs> that, that, you stole my line. I said, "Treat your geeks well." <laughs> well, the time has flown by. I've certainly enjoyed this conversation and learned a lot. Thank you all for your time. And again, I have my thanks to the panel for your time your energy and your excitement uh, uh, for this topic of technology and global competitiveness. And I just wanted to say, I learned a lot from sitting in the front row. I cannot, you know, uh, doze off, so to speak, pay attention to all the key points. I take my takeaway, really, to two points. One, technology is about business. Think about it, bring value. It's not about technology itself. I and technology is about change. And technology is about change management. I think has vision, uh, designation, and uh, construct a journey, the plan, and bring the people together. I learned a lot. So thank you again for the wisdom, the experience. As a small token appreciation, we have a little uh, gift for every campus. Let's give the panel another round of applause for, for, for the panel. Thank you. Uh, next will be uh, informal drink and eating and chat. Thank you again for coming.